everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s and today we're talking about fall and winter veggie gardening as well as um, harvest tips and just kind of like you know what's going on with your garden with your edible crops at this time of year. Uh, here we are in the Portland, Oregon area. It is um, August 11th. So we are in, I'm going to still call that early August, right? Not quite mid, um, but early August. It's been, uh, I don't know, a warmer than average summer, not as hot as um, maybe some of the peaks of last year, but you know, it's summer, right? So our um, here for us, at least in Portland, we got a late start on a lot of our summer plantings. The... Um, rains just would not stop this spring so it rained you know like through june um and was just weird so i know i'm i i didn't get my tomatoes and peppers and squash and warm season plants in uh as early as i normally do so typically i'm like targeting mother's day weekend to plant all those warm season crops but the soil wouldn't warm up it was too wet um, you know, every weekend I had a chance to plant, it was raining, you know, right? Um, so finally with things that got into the ground, they have, um, begun to ripen. Um, so, you know, I, I'm checking in with other gardeners, tomatoes are tomatoing, um, which is great. I have had, um, I had a good cucumber crop so far this year, so, um, Hooray to that, right? Uh, the So, you know, how's your crop going? Zucchini, yeah, yeah, we all have zucchini. So we can celebrate zucchini um, success and other summer squash. But at this point in um, the season, if you haven't fed your, your garden yet um, recently, then now would be a time to do that, whether it is with a granular fertilizer, if you've got tomato, vegetable, herb, uh, food around. We've got a nice big bag. If you have some of this, um, go ahead and give that to your plants as a granular feeding, like a side dressing or a top dressing um, that you scratch in and then water in. All purpose is another great one for uh, feeding your vegetable plants at this time of year. If that's what you've got in your garden shed or, you know, on hand, we want you to use up these fertilizers and then buy new ones because all these organic fertilizers are um, the granular ones have living organisms in them so they have probiotics that are inoculated into the fertilizer so um, each bag actually has an expiration date I remember. here we go 528 2024 so um, look in your shed check your expiration dates it's time to put that out if you're just sitting you know on a stockpile of fertilizer at home storing it and thinking that you'll have it when you need it um, make sure that you use it before it goes, uh, it doesn't go bad. But what happens is all those probiotics die. So all of the beneficial bacteria and microbes that are in there to help this product work better and feed your soil, they all run out of food in this little bag and die. So the bulk material is still there. The, you know, um, slow release organic material but you don't have the little microbes to help break it down and make it faster available to the plants. So feed now um, with your granular and then also uh, a liquid. If you've got a liquid on hand, um, because we're watering so much, our plants are in like full tilt, you know, they're like pedal to the metal. They're growing in hot, dry conditions, flowering, probably also trying to ripen fruit a lot going on for that plant and it needs like athlete type you know nutrition to finish this race you know so give it a little liquid fertilizer that's like a cup of coffee or an energy drink where these granular feedings are more of a longer lasting kind of stick to their ribs kind of food that's going to take them uh, for four to six weeks between feeding so um, here we are in August this is granular your last time you'll feed with granular fertilizer um, but you could feed several times, you know, once a week or even every 10 days or so with the liquid fertilizers. <clears throat> there is a handout 
Um, as always, it's attached to the um, top of this video, just right under the description that says like, welcome to Fall and Winter Veggie Class. Um, you'll see a hyperlink right there. Click it, you got the handout. If you don't got the handout, make a comment and we will make sure to just directly link it to you. Um, we wanna make it easy for you to get planting. As certain crops at this time of year are, you know, wrapping up, um, I pulled my pea, you know, my spring pea plants. I pulled them a couple of weeks ago. They were starting to get all dry. Um, I had harvested tons of peas. I had eaten lots of fresh peas. I have peas in the freezer, um, which is always one of my goals of like setting up some frozen peas that will take me into maybe December if I'm lucky. <clears throat> and so um, what goes in the place? of the types of plants that have run their course and get pulled. Carrots I've harvested, beets I've harvested, uh, my peas, as I mentioned, I pulled up some broccoli that I grew through the spring that um, ran its course. And so now I have some patches in my garden that are ready for either, um, you know, kind of being put to rest for the season or pull back to work. And uh, a lot of us, don't think about growing crops in the fall, well, growing crops for the fall and winter. Uh, and those of us that do think about growing crops for fall and winter often think about it, well, in fall or winter, which is actually a little too late. So that's the trick with growing veggies uh, into the cooler season is that we actually wanna get them started right now or uh, by you know mid-August, for example, so that they get a good six or eight weeks of warmer weather to put on a little bit of growth to create a nice root system that will then sustain them through the slow growing, you know, kind of, cruel winter months that might be cold, might be wet. Um, and a lot of times those plants are just kind of waiting and then they ripen in spring. Well, so that actually gets me to the harvest time. So timing is kind of broken down on your handout as far as what to put in this time of year. Um, I've got July, August, September, October, and November kind of laid out. Um, what you can plant this time of year and month by month, which includes in a lot of cases seeds or the starts. Um, so you can um, certainly be more economical with a lot of your gardening uh, in the fall by starting from seed, a package of um, organic dwarf curled kale from Botanical Interests is $2 and this is gonna make you a ton of kale. So $2 investment in seed and some time, of course, waiting for it to grow and some energy and a little bit of love and care from you. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we will have, you know, the um, pleasure of harvesting our own kale. Now, <coughs> you can also start these crops from uh, started transplants and put them into your garden as well. Some things you will see are more recommended to be grown from seed versus being grown from starts. And occasionally it depends on the time of year that you're going to plant and the temperature of your soil. Um, so something like this dwarf blue curled kale, it's a handful in my mouth, dwarf blue curled kale is, um, tells us on the package some really great information. It's frost tolerant, says that right under the um, price tag. So frost tolerant tells me, oh, this would be a great one to grow into the winter months. <clears throat> it is an heirloom variety. So who knew if you didn't know there were heirloom kale and you thought there was only heirloom tomatoes, heirloom everything, and you could grow it all. So dwarf, cur dwarf blue curled kale um, is an heirloom variety and it stays small, which is another thing that makes it kind of frost tolerant. So we'll talk about that, but smaller plants tend to do better in winter than like great big, you know, beefy, leafy plants. Um, now, gorgeous leaf vegetable, nutritious, delicious, um, and beautiful, it says. And it's got, uh, 
55 days. Um, don't know if I said that before or not, but so 55 days, when to sow outside, one to two weeks before your average frost, last frost date, or 10 to 12 weeks before your average first fall frost date for a fall crop. So 10 to 12 weeks before your average first fall frost date. Man, this seed packet is like tongue twister city. I didn't even realize that. Should have read it first. First fall frost date is typically in our area in early November. You can be safe and assume that it might come as early as Halloween, but usually within, within the like first week of November. So back count, count backwards on your calendar 10 or 12 weeks from Halloween. So let's see, we got all of October, we got all of September, that's eight. We got two weeks in August, that's 10. Another, well, if you went out and sowed this scale today, we would be at about 12 weeks, right? 11 maybe. And that's going to give us a fall harvest of this kale. And fall harvest means we're gonna be harvesting it in early November before the first frost. We could also though continue to sow this a little later into the season. So we're at 11 weeks, we could sow it again at 10 weeks or even nine weeks and have this uh, going further into the winter months. Now it may slow its growth, but because it says it's frost tolerant, we know that it's going to take the winter conditions. And being able to dash out in, you know, uh, well, so on Thanksgiving, for example, and harvesting some kale for your Thanksgiving um, side dish or salad, that's super cool. Um, but you could also have this kale last through the winter, harvesting few leaves at a time throughout the winter months. And then even, you know, um, it's going to grow more come spring, and then you'll probably just pick it so that you can sow a new crop at that point. So that might be March or April when it's finally wrapping up for the season. That's a long time of harvesting kale from a $2 seed packet. So uh, the advantages that we find in growing our crops in the fall and for fall and winter harvest include, well, first of all, what else are you going to do with all that space that you've devoted to vegetables in your garden? I mean, um, you can only grow tomatoes and peppers one time a year in the peak of summer. Eggplants, uh, corn, you know, cucumbers when it's hot and you get that one shot. They're going to wrap up before frost. We have the opportunity often to grow greens and root crops. Uh, and some of these, like I talked about, these gourmet greens like kale, root crops such as lead, excuse me, such as leeks, onions, carrots, beets, all the way into the winter months. We can grow them in the spring when it's cool, and again, come fall, when it starts to cool off again, we can plant those same kind of crops. So twice a year, often, we get that chance to grow a crop of kale or the other plants. That's one. Second advantage to growing at this, at this time of year is root crops such as parsnips, carrots, beets. Root crops often get sweeter and their sugars concentrate when they get exposed to f light frosts or average frosts. So winter crops taste better than uh, spring sown or summer crops do in, in those root crop cases. <coughs> Excuse me. Thirdly, the advantage of growing when it's cool and even mildly freezing is that there are fewer pests. Let's face it. Um, if you've grown kale, you've had aphids, right? So um, if you have not grown kale, if you have grown kale and have not had aphids, then we all want to know your secret because um, aphids are just off, all, often found associated with kale, but especially when we're growing in the spring and summer months. 
there are less and less aphids during the fall and winter weather, so we see less of a pest problem on kale plants, for example, when they're grown in the cool. So fewer pests, sweeter flavor or better flavor, and then just the advantage again of using vacant space. Now, if you're not gonna plant food in the vegetable garden as you pull up some of your crops that they, uh, you know, that are wrapping up and you're harvesting, you can still use um, that soil productively by sowing seeds of like a cover crop. And a cover crop would be a nourishing annual crop that you just sow to grow in vacant space in the garden to kind of take its place. Often they are, um, well, their soil, the, they benefit the soil, so they're legume crops like clovers or peas, and they're feeding the soil with a little bit of a special root-associated bacteria that pulls nitrogen down out of the atmosphere. And then you turn the roots and plant material under in spring to add nitrogen to the soil, um, which then feeds the soil for the future. So cover crops are a whole nother great thing that you can do for your veggie garden as you're pulling out uh, the, the crops that you harvest. But if you would like to have uh, more opportunities to grow food in your garden later into the season, um, then this is the time to start putting in and strategizing about planting things for fall and winter harvest. Now, um, those are two different. It's not like fall or winter, it's often, it's fall, and winter but winter may also mean like early early spring so let me break that down uh, crops planted during summer may be ready between september and october uh, or grown over the winter for harvest in early spring so that's kind of the very uh, specific i guess statement of what the differences are so uh, when we have fall harvest crops, those are more of the tender greens that don't do well with exposure to frost. I mean, kale, the, our dwarf curled kale, some of the, um, let's see, where have I got? Lacinato or, you know, that kind of um, big, it ends up being real curly, dark leafed kale, the dinosaur or lacinato kale. And then this red boar, which is one of the more frilly Russian kales. These are sturdier leaves than like a standard lettuce. So these leaves are able to tolerate a light frost on them. Whereas crops like lovely leaf lettuce, look how beautiful that is. Such a just jewel box assortment. It's like chocolates, you know, uh, flashy trout black. We've got an, a red oak leaf lettuce up front. There's a... That's probably Jericho, which is a little romaine style. This is the uh, leaf lettuce wild garden mix, by the way. And um, most of our garden centers have just gotten in um, this fresh assortment of fall and winter vegetable starts, as well as a good seed selection. So, um, I mean, these lettuces are practically ready to eat. They're certainly ready to plant, um, but practically ready to eat. So that's one out of a pack and you'll be um, so happy that you put those in the ground and gave them a little extra protection according to the heat. So we'll get into that too. But spinach, lettuce, softer leaves, they're going to be that fall harvest before we get into a lot of freezing temperatures because frost will start to melt their leaves. Um, but broccoli and cauliflower, most of the kales, <clears throat> Swiss chard, these are sturdier leaves that are able to tolerate that colder weather. So um, overwintering crops are meant to be planted now. So our little spinaches, for example, we would put in a spinach from seed or from transplant. Here I have, again, one little sixth of my uh, six pack here. So, but we're still actually looking at one, two, three, four, there are four spinach plants together in this six pack. You could spread them out, you could snip off, I would snip off at least two of these and like eat them right away. Just put them in your sandwich, throw them in this morning's egg scramble, um, 
tuck them into dinner. No one will even notice. And you've, um, you know, not uh, wasted their little lives. But this spinach, we want to put in now, we expect it to do some growth in the next 10, 12 weeks, but then we really want it to stay on the small side going into winter. Sorry, it's kind of dripping wet. So we want it to stay small going into winter. We don't want to like juice up the plant with a bunch of fertilizer and have it grow big because big leafy plants are a liability in the cold weather. We want our spinach to make roots, get a little bit of top growth, kind of just get itself situated in the garden and then wait essentially so that we harvest it we can harvest a few leaves through the winter, but we're really going to see that spinach come to fruition in early spring, March or April. Now, if you're a spring gardener, you know that you are you haven't even gone out to plant anything quite yet as early as March or April. I mean, maybe peas, but March, April um, is still almost winter. Um, and to go out and have ripe spinach at that point in the season, um, nothing that you could have planted in the spring would be ready that early. So as you pull out your wintering spinach in March, then you could sow peas. Um, and that would be a perfect way to even use that space in crop rotation, which if that's something that you're trying to do, um, that's a noble effort. And I uh, suggest crop rotation just so that you don't exhaust your garden and come up with a lot of diseases as well. So um, peas following spinach would be a great use of space. But overwintering, again, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, and kale. Uh, then if grown under a cold, cold frame, Asian greens, so it would be like pak choy, um, cilantro, lettuce, spinach, Swiss chard, all of these can be grown all winter. <clears throat> One of my um, absolute favorite greens to teach people about is a, um, is a plant that very few people are familiar with. And when they are, they're like, oh yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. So this is called, it has a lot of names. It's called mash, M-A-C-H-E, um, might be mashe, I don't know. Corn salad is another name. So corn salad, mosh. And this is a variety that's called big seeded. Now there's a couple of different types, but you'll be lucky to just find something that says corn salad. It's not corn. Um, and I'm not sure why the name, but this is like a nutty. It's very small. It's a delicious nutty green that sort of tastes like arugula without the spiciness of arugula. Um, mildest flavor, softest texture that they say leaves so tender they melt in your mouth. This grows great in containers. Um, it's the seed is pretty good sized. So even kids can, can sow the seed. It's not so small that it's hard to handle or hard to, to plant. This seed will germinate in soil as cold as 40 degrees. Um, so you can grow this even later into the fall from seed or it can be one of the earliest things that you plant in the spring when you're out planting peas. <clears throat> Mosh, don't forget it. Um, how do you know when the soil is right for you to plant? Well, of course you're using a soil thermometer. Now, um, I have talked about this in other edible gardening classes, but a soil thermometer is really essential. Um, I find it essential not only to know when to plant in the spring, but to know my limits on certain plantings in the summer months. Right now, because it's been relatively mild, my soil, which has a, a good layer of mulch on top of it, my garden soil is hovering right about 70 to 72 degrees, which is I take the temperature in the morning um, and we want an average temperature, right? So that's just throughout the day. Sure, it gets warmer uh, in the heat of the day, but it cools down a little bit. Lettuce. <clears throat> Kale and a few other plants will really only, I mean, they, most crops have certain temperatures in which the seed's going to germinate or when you should transplant them out. And all of that 
can be found on the back of the soil thermometer packaging. And usually you can find that information on the tags for your transplant starts or on the seed start packets, them, on the seed packets themselves. Lettuce doesn't want to germinate in soil that's hotter than 75 degrees. We don't want a tomato to go into the ground if it's colder than 60 degrees. But you can plant mosh corn salad and peas when the soil reaches 40 or 45 degrees. So that is a lot of different uh, benchmarks for you that there's really no other way to know uh, than using a soil thermometer. Sure, you can go back to things like your handout, um, a planting calendar, and just kind of say, let's see, here we are in August, I can seed these plants outdoors, arugula, beets, broccoli, blah, blah, blah. But again, using and getting kind of used to just using your <clears throat> soil thermometer will um, start to teach you a little bit more about the rhythms of the garden and how the soil heats up and cools down in the fall or through the seasons, I guess. <coughs> now, most of these things are, uh, as I mentioned, greens especially, can be grown really well in pots and containers. So if you would prefer to not go all the way out into your vegetable garden, for example, in the winter time, maybe you only want to go as far as your back porch or your back deck. As long as it's got some sunlight to it, you know, remember the sun shifts in the winter so that it's really kind of low in the south sky, kind of, you know, sneaks over and spends a short day. So make sure that you're not um, trying to grow your food on the north side in the winter months. You won't have a lot of success. But put your plants out on the west or southwest side of the house. Grow in pots if you want. Just remember that pots can freeze a little bit more easily than things in the ground, which means that you might need to give them a little extra protection as well as if it isn't raining or if they're under any kind of roof cover, you will also need to make sure that you're giving the potted plants supplemental water or enough water. I have um, just a, you know, perfect sized uh, plastic container to go on your patio or your deck. This could easily grow several plants of kale or Swiss chard, let's say at least three, maybe four full-size plants of kale, Swiss chard. This is deep enough to grow uh, leeks or carrots or a root crop, for example. And I have thrown a, not thrown, I have put a peony cage. It looks like a tomato cage, but it's actually a little bit wider and missing like one extra ring. Uh, this is a peony cage. I stuck it in this pot because this then provides me with a little bit of a frame to in a, um, you know, freeze warning or if I needed to protect this plant, I could take a sheet or some dish towels, or if you've got this product called Harvest Guard, it's a very lightweight frost cloth. Um, you can cut it into sections if you wanted, or you know, just drape it across everything. I would then drape my Harvest Guard over top of this. You could use uh, clothespins, zip ties. I like to use um, what are they called that you put on paper, like big, big stacks of paper at the office? Binder clips. Binder clips. Binder clips, Becky. Uh, binder clips are great. They are, you know, everybody's got some or, you know, take some from work, right? Uh, and they can clip onto the sides and hold your harvest guard or hold it from, you know, weaving away, waving away in the wind. Um, so that this little cage could double up, you know, next season as a peony support or even a short tomato cage. Fits in um, square containers as well, although it's a little bit funky in a square pot. And this pot's just a little bit smaller, shorter and a little bit uh, smaller. I don't think I would try to grow like carrots and root crops as much in a short pot like this, but this pot would be fine for greens. Um, so you could certainly go ahead and do chard and kale and lettuce and all that um, wonderful greens in a smaller container, but consider using something larger um, when you wanna do the whole root crop thing. Now you could also do like carrots and lettuce in a pot like this. So you could double up and have crops that go down and crops that go up to maximize your space. 
And when planting in August, I mean, let's face it, that's not, that's the hardest part. It's not easy to put tender, brand new plants out in the heat of August. Looking ahead, my 10 day forecasts, like 93, 94, 97. That's really hard. These are babies. They don't have uh, these tender, lovely, succulent greens. Don't have the like waxy old leaves of like mature plants that are able to withstand being out in that kind of sun. We need to get them through the next, you know, eight, six, eight weeks of heat. And then they're going to be able to be happy in the cool or mild and kind of ever cooling temperatures as we go into the fall. Putting them in this time of year, it's important to give these plantings um, some form of relief. In, uh, and, and what I mean by that is at least some temporary shade or plant them on the far side, like on the shady side of your tall summer crops. I mean, right now, tomatoes, right? You got <clears throat> tomatoes that are over your head, I'm sure, or you should. Um, corn should be tall. Uh, lots of your garden plants should be good sized at this time in the season, which means that they are casting some form of shade. That shade caused by those great big tomato plants is a super cool spot, literally super cool spot to put in your greens. Um, and then as you pull out those tomatoes, you can allow the greens to take the space that they'll need as they ripen through the season. If you don't have big tall tomatoes or other tall crops already growing in the garden, um, creating temporary shade in the form of, um, you know, again, draping. You could, new plantings, gonna be 97 degrees. Just stick in some poles or tomato cages and drape over the same harvest guard cloth. It's not just to protect plants from frost. This can also protect plants from heat and sunlight. It's um, lightweight and like gauzy. So you can see through it a little bit, of light goes through it. You can water straight through it actually. I mean, water kind of does penetrate it. It's not as easy, um, but this will help to keep plants cool. Or again, drag your patio umbrella over. If it's 97 degrees, you're probably not sitting out on the patio either. So put your patio umbrella over and give your plants some temporary shade from this intense weather, especially if you're putting in new plantings. If you're sowing from seed, if you're gonna put carrot seed in this week or this weekend, um, which you, I mean, we're a little bit late, they say, but you know, this is Napoli carrot. It is a 55 day carrot. They usually say have carrots sown by mid July, but um, you know, let's try it, right? I mean, what have you got to lose? Carrots often um, will be able to survive through the winter. And then if they don't make it by frost and they don't grow this winter, they may finish growing in spring. And so you could be surprised as you pull up the tops to find that your carrots have bottoms, um, you know, later in the season. But sowing anything from seed right now, carrots, kale, beets, it's also going to be difficult in 97 degrees or whatever it is where you are to keep the soil moist, to keep the soil, uh, that seed bed in kind of a, a shallow, you know, most of these seeds are going to sit right on the surface or maybe be buried, uh, you know, peas are buried, what, an inch down, inch, inch and a half. So you're trying to keep an inch to an inch and a half of the soil moist or damp so the seed can germinate. That's going to be really hard when it's 97 degrees, unless you can literally pull up a, you know, let chase lounge and hit it with a squirt gun every 20 minutes to keep the soil moist. You could run a sprinkler, but again, um, all day long until the seed germinates, which on a peas uh, case is, could be eight to 25 days. Well, the soil's warm enough that the seeds will germinate in about eight days, but that still means you need to keep the soil damp for a week or so while those seeds are germinating. 
an easier technique than sitting out there and squirting it is to cover, so wet your soil, sow your seed, wet it, wet it again, and then cover the seed itself by directly laying right down on the soil either sheet like one or two thick sheets of newspaper or again like a damp rag or dish towel the, the seeds don't need light they're already underground right so just something that covers the soil or pieces of the harvest guard again just laid directly onto the soil surface if you peel that harvest guard back you'll find that it's still damp underneath versus if that soil was just left bare and exposed to the sunlight. So any kind of covering, remember again, we don't want something heavy. So a couple of sheets of newspaper are light, nice and lightweight. You can wet them every day or a couple of times a day to um, keep it moist and to keep the soil underneath it damp. Uh, but that will help it germinate and you'll want to peak underneath, you know, after about a week or depending on what the germination time frame is lift up the cover and see if you've had germination yet if you have little green sprouts sticking up above the soil once you do you can remove the covering and start to just water them as kind of a regular planting now in the spring at the end of winter those crops that have spent the winter with you as tiny little rugged waiting delicious packets of nutrients right spinach has sat with you all winter long as the winter months go on it may the spinach may turn yellow or sort of um, lose its color some of our greens will it's that nutrition doesn't um, become available as quickly in cold soil. So as we though also want to keep the plants small through the winter, we can give them like a spring wake up to green them up as the temperatures are warming in the soil. So our spinach is always a good example of that because it is such a, you know, good healthy spinach is just a, like a deep dark green. And of course we know spinach is a great source of iron in addition to a lot of other nutrients that it has. So that deep, deep green um, color, we want to return to the spinach as it kind of starts to grow in the spring. And we can wake it up because the nitrogen isn't necessarily available quick enough for it in spring. We can wake up the spring crops with a liquid fertilizer. So liquid feeding, something like uh, the Alaska 511 is 5% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, 1% potassium. It's a great water soluble, like breakfast smoothie for your like overwintering greens to just start to green them up and wake them up for the spring growing season. You can also use a more nitrogen rich single amendment like bat guano. Um, this is 7% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, 1% potassium. And bat guano can be made into a fertilizer tea, like um, just added to water, brewed a little bit, let to kind of steep over time. And then that liquid is the water soluble part that you could feed also to your spinach to give it that immediate pickup instead of um, the solids, the granular bits will take a little bit longer to break down and become plant available in the soil. <clears throat> now, root crops um, that you may want to consider growing in this time of year, <clears throat> you can put in onions from um, little, like Walla Walla onions, you can put those in from little green shoots right now, and the Walla Wallas will create their onion the, the bulb of the onion by mid-summer next season <clears throat> garlic goes in usually in october so we wait a little bit longer for garlic planting season but when garlic goes in you're going to break off each of the little individual cloves of garlic from the head 
plant your clove of garlic and again those go in in october and you're gonna harvest them the following like june or maybe july one clove of garlic makes a whole new head so um the multiplication of garlic can be really fun and such an easy thing to plant in your garden in a space that you know maybe you're pulling up again those summer plantings and crops right now leeks are another great one to grow leeks are one of my favorite things to grow at this time of year because um you can go ahead and cut you know just like bunching onions or green onions you can cut young leeks you can cut young onions but leeks are i mean first of all they're like in so many soup and winter like casserole dishes leeks are a cross um i think they're a cross between garlics a garlic and an onion so or maybe they're more in the garlic family anyways they're delicious and they're super expensive at the store like ridiculously expensive but i guess that's because um so the, it takes this is a 110 days until maturity for a leek so that's a pretty long harvest, uh, whereas, you know, carrots are 55 days. So there's twice as we grow two full crops of carrots in the time it takes to grow one crop a leek. I guess that maybe makes sense that carrots are twice as le half the price of leeks, whatever. We'll check that out at the grocery store. But leeks also, you can get a leek to um, go to seed. I allow some of my plants to go to seed and then they sow themselves. So they plant themselves and start over uh, in my garden as, um, you know, like the son of last year's leek, um, which I think is also really awesome. Leeks end up in my garden as something that's uh, essentially perennial. They last through the winter. I allow some to flower. The spring growth, they come back up and I've got a kind of perpetual uh, harvest of leeks that are always at various stages in the garden. So you can get that going with things like leeks. Um, that mosh I was telling you about, corn salad, just grows from seed in my garden because I allowed it to go to seed. Um, I have spinach that I allowed to go to seed. And um, yeah, spinach goes to flower. And when you see a spinach flower, it's too late to pull it out so just let it sit there and spread its little puffy seeds around in your garden and then the next time you are weeding you might notice hey that plant looks kind of like spinach and it probably is um, so you can allow plants to go to seed and grow themselves often um, kind of leading to an easier harvest because or well an easier planting because seed starting for some people is like oh a lot of people are nervous about starting from seed, but if it just happens in your garden and you didn't even do it, that is almost should give you confidence of realizing like, wow, um, seeds must be a little bit easier than I thought to start. Now, um, I did say that there are fewer pests out in the fall, and I mean like fewer types of pests, but slugs, which have sort of taken the summer off um, because it's been hot and dry, a lot of us in hot, sunny gardens have not had to deal too much with slugs at this point in the season. They um, are really a bigger issue in milder temperatures and cooler weather and rainy seasons. But we're about to go into milder temperatures, cooler weather and rainy seasons in the fall. So as we cool off in the fall, as you put out like a whole new batch of these tender, succulent, delicious fall and winter plantings, be sure to consider that slugs have been counting on you doing it. And they are waiting for um, the feast and to like reemerge in uh, the cool, wet weather to have something to eat. Fall slugs um, are basically the breeding population of your spring slugs. So I'm gonna say that again. The slugs that are in your garden this fall are there to make babies and the babies will eat your spring plants. So if you don't do something about the slugs in your garden in the fall, those slugs are just gonna make more slugs in your garden for spring. Um, so consider using a slug bait like Slug Magic or Sluggo 
These are both iron phosphate based products. Iron phosphate is naturally occurring in the garden, in your soil, although this is in a higher concentration. This is um, safe around edibles, pet and wildlife safe as well. So if you're not a slug or a snail, um, this is not gonna bother you. And it's palletized, so you can hear how uh, palletized it is. Comes in like a little shaker type dispenser, so you could just like sprinkle, sprinkle if you wanted. This is a two and a half pound container, which covers 2,500 square feet. And each application lasts about 30 days, although I like to put it down about every three weeks just to make sure that I've got good overlap. It's a very effective slug bait, um, and it does not go bad. No expiration date on it. Better make sure of that. No expiration date on it, so um, again, <clears throat> get yourself some slug bait, get plenty, and don't run out during the winter months. Um, store in your shed and put a timer on your, you know, calendar or what, put a calendar alert in to remind you to put it out there every so often. You will be ever so thankful for me, to me, for doing it. With that said, um, I've got around me for pretty, for prettiness. Um, some amazing hydrangeas that are just, the hydrangeas look so good right now. These are the panicle style hydrangeas. So these are the sun lovers. This is Bobo. Um, and Bobo is one of my favorite panicle style for um, just this crisp white flower that stands really sturdy. Um, it is a mo moderate sized plant, about three feet tall, three to four feet wide. It's um, still got a lot of flowers developing, and these blooms will slowly age to kind of a, a pale pink um, as we get cooler nighttime temperatures um, turning into fall. And then next to Bobo, this gorgeous, uh, this gorgeous pink and white flower, you can see like the difference on the flower where it's pink on the bottom here if I lift it up, you can see that it's still kind of greenish white on the underside. And that just shows the effect of kind of cold and sunlight on the, more sunlight in this case, to age the flower and turn that, that pink color kind of quickly. So again, lots of pink on this side. If I f kind of turn it around, you can see that it's really quite um, ivory white on this side. This is Diamond Rouge, is that right? Diamond Rouge it is. Um, Diamond Rouge, another panicle style hydrangea, four to five feet tall, three to four feet wide. Big, beautiful flower, flower clusters. Again, that cone shape or panicle style. Both of these hydrangeas do fine in full sun to partial sun uh, with plenty of supplemental water. The um, only place that I wouldn't put them when they're out in sun would be in reflective heat situations. So if there was like a big plate glass window behind or a hot uh, wooden deck or cement patio from uh, the heat that would radiate off of those surfaces would just make that sun a little bit more of an intense place for the hydrangea to do well. But out in full sun exposure would do fantastic. On the other side of my table, I could not help but well, I admit, I just was um, eating it. I was just eating this blueberry. And as I was eating the ripe blueberries, I thought, huh, I should probably bring this blueberry in and show it off in class before I eat all of the ripe berries on it. Because they're huge. Not the berry, the, not the plant itself. This plant is, um, you know, just a good sized two gallon start. This is a variety of blueberry called Chandler. Um, isn't that the guy and friends right yeah so if you were if you watched friends if you're that old like me Chandler um, otherwise I don't know Chandler somebody's name probably Chandler blueberries are one of the largest growing fruit size blueberry that is available I don't know if that was like a word salad in itself but the fruit is big I'll just say that they can get to be like cherry sized and I'm gonna put three of them in the palm of my hand and almost fill my hand. Like what? 
you know, blueberries are supposed to be small. Stay, stay put, Chandler. <clears throat> Look at how beautiful. Okay, there's a thumb, there's a blueberry, right? Big, big, big berries and sweet, sweet berries that are ripe right now. I don't know if all of our garden centers have them, but like a sweet goes got Chandler's. And if you come soon, I won't have eaten them all. Um, but don't wait. Got to tell you. And with that, uh, eat, eat well, eat out of your garden, harvest and sow new crops, try new things, and uh, happy gardening. Thanks for watching.